Carpe Diem VPN. Seize the data. Are you a network engineer who's not sure where to start learning cloud networking? Is all cloud network training focused on the apps and none focused on the network? I'm Tim McConaughey, a cloud network architect, and today we're going to start all the way at the beginning for those network engineers that just want to focus on networking in the clouds. First off, let's just set the stage for how data centers work with the cloud providers. Every cloud service provider is just a new lipstick on an old managed service provider face. The CSP is a hell of a lot bigger than your local MSP, but the same general idea applies. With an MSP, you're using their space, their equipment, their networking, and they manage a lot of that or all of that with you so you can focus on the things that drive revenue for the business, like applications. I'll start with AWS because it's the most well-known and it still has the highest market share. So this video will use AWS terms and be focused on the AWS way of building networks, but I'll do Azure and Google Cloud down the road so you can see the differences. Here's a very basic diagram showing just the basic CSP layer without any of the networking built on top. AWS has multiple geographic regions all over the world they use to physically group their data center footprints in a meaningful way for customers and for their administration. In this example, the US West 1 region is located in Northern California. Now the AZ, or Availability Zone, ties directly to a physical data center. Every AWS region consists of one or more AZ data centers. These data center locations are made to be far enough away from each other as to be redundant, yet close enough that fiber between them keeps the latency low. Within a region, you as a customer can create one or more Virtual Private Clouds, or VPC. Now when AWS first started offering services to customers, they thought that for every customer, one VPC would be enough for everything they ever wanted to do. But it turns out that VPCs offer a strict boundary that customers often use for administrative and security reasons, which means customers like to subdivide a lot of their applications into multiple VPCs. Now, VPCs as a logical construct cover an entire AWS region, and each VPC exists within every availability zone in that region, and that's part of the resiliency and redundancy strategy you need to think about when building a cloud network. Now let's quickly create a VPC in the AWS console that we can explore and expand on later. So within the AWS console, they've given us two ways to create a VPC. We can create just the VPC and then manually create all the subcomponents, or they've given us a workflow where we can create the VPC and all of the subcomponents at the same time. Now, since we're trying to learn about all the VPC subcomponents ourselves, we're going to do this manually. We're going to create a name for the VPC, assign a CIDR block to the VPC, and just use IPv4 in this case. We can play with IPv6 later, but that uh, IPv4 CIDR 10.10.0.0/24 covers the entire VPC. So that's all of the uh, IP addressing we have within this VPC is going to fit within that. And from that, we can carve individual subnets, just like we would at a real network. All right, we'll go ahead and save this. And on the next screen, you can see we've just got the VPC and a couple uh, system-created tools, like a DHCP option set for any workloads we create within the VPC, a uh, main route table, which we'll get into in a little bit, and of course, an, an, a main network ACL, which again, we'll get into another time. A network subnet is a logical group and boundary just as it is on-prem. And in AWS, every subnet must be tied to an availability zone. And that means all subnets built and tied to AZA in this diagram, or AZ1 in this diagram, physically exist inside the CSP at one data center. So when thinking about latency and compute, that may be a desirable outcome. We need to add subnets to our VPC so our workloads can be logically separated from each other. Let's walk through creating one, and I'll finish the rest of them off screen so we can move on. From the VPC console in AWS, you just have to choose subnets and then create subnet. Choose the VPC that we, you just created, and in that VPC is where we're gonna create our subnet. So we have to give our subnet a name, and then of course we have to assign it to an availability zone. And again, this is a discrete data center that AWS owns and operates. So that subnet is tied specifically to that data center. And of course, using the VPC CIDR, we need to subdivide the total CIDR into the size of the subnet we're gonna use. So in this case, we're gonna use a slash 28, and we can go ahead and create that subnet. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and create the other ones from the diagram, uh, just to not be repetitive. 
Inside every logical VPC is a VPC route table. We can think of a VPC route table as an exposed VRF on a router. Each VPC in AWS needs only one route table to cover the entire VPC, but you have the flexibility to create a route table for each subnet if you need it. Each route table is like a router VRF, and each subnet is like a network attached to the router interface. You just can't manage the router directly. Just like an MSP, you can only control what the provider exposes to you. Now I'm going to create some custom route tables for my private subnets and one single route table to apply to both of my public subnets. I'll explain what, what I mean by public and private subnets in the, in the next section coming up. From the AWS console, we just go to route tables and there we're going to create a route table. The first thing we have to do or should do is give every route table that we create a name. So in this case, I'll use private uh, route table for AZA and we're going to tie the route table. Every route table has to be tied to a VPC, so we're going to tie that to the app VPC. Now that it's created, you can see it only has one local entry in it right now, one route. Um, we need to associate the route table to the subnet. If we don't associate a route table to a subnet, the subnet inherits the main route table of the VPC. Right? Remember I said we can create route tables and associate them with a particular subnet. So if we go into subnet associations, we can choose the subnets that we want to associate our route table with. And we could do one or multiple. In this case, I'm just going to do one. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is create a public route table. And this public route table will actually uh, be applied to multiple subnets, both of my public subnets. And we'll see why when we start filling the uh, public subnet with some uh, constructs. But right now I'm just going to apply this one subnet to both, or rather this one route table to both public subnets. Workloads and applications inside a VPC won't get very far with no connectivity to the outside. VPCs can have an internet gateway attached so that workloads within the VPC can reach the internet. And the IGW covers the whole VPC, but it's not a real router. It's best to think of an IGW like a one-to-one -one NAT table for internet connectivity. Uh, more on this in a moment. Let's go ahead and attach an IGW to this VPC so that the workloads can have access to the internet. And then I'll explain the private and public subnet piece. The IGW is really easy. You just go from the VPC console to Internet Gateways, create it, and then attach it to the VPC that you want the IGW to be attached to, and that's it. Now the diagram shows public and private subnets. What makes a subnet public is whether or not it has a default route to the Internet Gateway that will allow Internet access. Private subnets will not have a default route that points at the IGW directly. In this case, we're going to add an AWS service called NAT Gateway instead. NAT Gateway requires something called an elastic IP. That's a public IP address that AWS owns and we can reserve for the NAT Gateway service. What's important to understand is that the NAT Gateway is really just some sort of virtual machine under the covers that's doing a dynamic PAT port address translation uh, for traffic directed to it. The Elastic IP isn't actually even being assigned to the machine itself. What's actually happening is that the IGW attached to the VPC is getting a static one-to-one -one NAT entry associated with the NAT gateway, so that when traffic is sent by the NAT gateway to the internet, the IGW will use the public IP that's been reserved for it. Let's deploy an AWS NAT gateway into our public subnets. The NAT gateway needs an Elastic IP as well, so we'll reserve that along with it and deploy that in our public subnets. Then we need to make sure that the route tables get updated for the private and public subnets to ensure that private traffic is using the NAT gateway. Before we get started, a couple things about NAT gateways. First of all, you don't actually need a separate NAT gateway for every single availability zone. Uh, that's mostly done for redundancy purposes and also potentially for cost savings purposes. AWS charges you money when you send traffic between availability zones. So if you have workloads in AZA and they're using AZB's NAT gateway to get out, there is an actual data transfer fee associated with sending traffic from AZA to AZB and back. So not only redundancy, but there's, there's a lot of cost considerations you have to think about when designing a cloud network. Now it could be that you know there's not you're not sending a huge volume of traffic where that matters. Maybe the cost of running a second NAT gateway 
is actually less, or sorry, is more than just the paying the data transfer charges from a different AZ. So that is something you need to think about, especially from a resiliency and cost perspective. So first we have to give our NAT gateway a name. Again, every resource you create in AWS should have a name. Then we're gonna tie it to a subnet. In this case, we're gonna deploy our NAT gateway in public subnet AZA. We're gonna make it a public NAT gateway and we're gonna allocate an elastic IP for it. And then just click on create NAT gateway and it's now built. So it's deployed in the subnet with an elastic IP and we can use, start using it anytime now. The next thing to do is to go to the route table the, pro the private uh, route table for AZA, and we're actually gonna add a default route pointing at that new NAT gateway we just created. So you can see I've already created the one for B just for redundancy purposes, and so we don't have to do it twice, um, but we're gonna go in and change that default route to point at that NAT gateway, A to A and B to B. We need to go to the private route table B now, and we'll do the same thing, but this time we're gonna point it at the NAT gateway in uh, availability zone B. Again, just A to A, B to B, keep the redundancy and the data transfer costs low. And the last thing we need to do is to go to the public route table and actually add our default route from the public route table, which again covers both A and B, to point at the one internet gateway that is attached to our uh, VPC. So that finishes up our first kind of primer on basic cloud networking within AWS using a single VPC, giving access to the internet for those workloads. If you found this interesting, please, you know, like, subscribe, leave a comment, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, and, and let me know if this is useful or if this is too basic or even if I, if it's not basic enough. Uh, my hope is that network engineers will see this as a, a way to start with cloud networking. And um, in the next one, I will talk about how we can connect VPCs together using VPC peering and editing some route tables and whatnot so that we can send traffic between VPCs in the most basic way possible. Thanks for joining me and take care.